Dr. Tim McGrew is professor and former chairman of the Department of Philosophy at Western Michigan University, where he teaches in the graduate program. His areas of specialization include epistemology, history and philosophy of science, formal logic, probability theory, and philosophy of religion. His recent publications include the article on, quote, evidence for the Rutledge Companion to Epistemology, a paper on, quote, the argument from silence in Acta Analytica, and the article on miracles in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. He is a leading authority on the history of apologetics in the English language and is currently working on a project to create an extensively cross-indexed database of historical works on the subject of special divine action, including a very wide range of perspectives. He would like to invite the authors of those works to the BBC tonight, and most of them probably would have come, but unfortunately they are all dead. <laughs> Dr. McGrew lives in Michigan with his wife and three daughters. When he's relaxing, he enjoys playing chess and was Michigan chess champion in 2006. Addressing the topic are the Gospels and Book of Acts, reliable historical documents. Please welcome Dr. Timothy McGrew. tried to persuade them to turn off the floodlights so that you could see the screen better. They replied that then you couldn't see me. I didn't think that was any great loss, but from their perspective, this is the best setup, so we'll make the most of it. I'll try to stay close to the microphone. If I kind of wander away, somebody like flag me and say, G get back. Uh, actually, you're going to throw something? Tomatoes? Right, okay. These, these guys are going to like bring me back, so I may not be the most dynamic and mobile speaker, but you will be able to hear what I say. We're doing two screens at once. I can kind of see what I'm doing on the screen back there. And if I go like this now and again, that's the reason why. Um, I've also been extremely well fed. What is it with you guys in Texas? You actually have like sizable portions for your meals. Is this a Texas thing generally? And here we are all meeting after dinner. So if I fall asleep while I'm speaking, or you fall asleep while I'm speaking, I'm just going to put it down to that. Um, but I am just delighted. Thank you so much for Ezra and for Alan and the others who have worked so hard to make this possible. I think this is a fabulous idea, and I am just delighted to see people here. I know some of you are uh, going to have a lot of questions. Ezra showed me a selection of questions that have been submitted by some of the atheists, and they look good. So I'm hoping we can talk about those, and I think that some of those will be answered or at least addressed as we go along in this talk. Uh-oh, a little gain there. I should back up. Uh, so I usually like to start these talks with an epigraph from, yeah, let's see. Are we making it work here? <laughs> that worked. OK, yeah, there we are, I think. Yeah, now, and now it's like jumping forward, forward? Or are we there? Yeah, there we are. We're good, okay. So from Luke chapter one, uh, Luke writing to Theophilus says, it seemed good to me also having followed all things closely for some time past to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. The word for certainty there is the same root word from which we get our word asphalt, and it really means solidity, something that you can stand on. And I hope that you will understand why many of us think that this is indeed the case when it comes to the Gospels and Acts. I'm going to be talking about historical reliability. And boy, am I, am I jiggering this thing wrong or did it forward? Try again. Hey, there we are. So I have a non-technical sense of the term historical reliability that I want to use, and I simply, uh, you know, I'm not trying to be too finicky about this definition. Here's the way that I understand it. A document is historically reliable if the fact that it makes a claim about a factual matter generally affords a significant prima facie reason to accept the claim, at least in broad outline. 
So you see several qualifying phrases in there, right? We just lost screen altogether. Was that because of me? Yeah, it was. Okay. Uh, so first, this is not equivalent to infallibility. Those of you who have come hoping that you'll hear some kind of robust defense of a theological position on inerrancy or infallibility or something like that, this is a historical talk. I, it's not really of any interest to me here to try to make any claims beyond the sort of claims that I would like to make for Herodotus or Josephus. So we're going to be focused entirely on this as a historical question. If you want a theological answer, ask somebody who's more of a specialist in that than I am. I'm going to approach this as a historian. It also allows for some errors of detail and for specific exceptions based on further considerations. So, for example, as you're reading Josephus, you might say, you know, he's got a lot of really good information, but when it comes to the portrayal of the zealots among the Jews, Man, he really wants to pin on them the guilt for everything that happened to the Jewish nation in the sack of Jerusalem. Not sure that this former Pharisee, now turned Roman uh, advocate, is going to give a fair light to them. So you might want to carve out specific exceptions. That's fine. That said, Josephus still gives us a lot of really good information that we can verify down to the color of the paint on Herod Antipas' bedroom wall. That's pretty darn good. And uh, third, this provides a defeasible justification. I don't know if that took, did it? There we go. Yeah, and what I mean by that is, when I say that it affords a significant prima facie reason, what I mean is you can trust it to the extent that if you had no counter evidence, you would be within your rights epistemically in maintaining it, in believing it, in holding it. Maybe you do have other information. That's good. Bring it. But we're just talking about what it means for the document to be historically reliable in that sense. So how do we establish historical reliability? Well, we have a couple of ways of trying to do this. We could do it from the character and situation of the author. Is this author honest, capable, close to the events? That would be great if we could get at those things independently. But it's very rare that we have really solid information about an author that would permit us to do that. There are some cases perhaps in modern history where we feel we can document that well enough, but generally we have to go at it indirectly. And so when we do that, we go after it from multiple points of contact between the document in question and other independent sources of information. Those kinds of sources of information may help us to tell whether the author is well informed and habitually truthful. And they also provide, and this is kind of important, a negative test. So, can, I don't know, sometimes the, you, it might get cut off at the bottom of the screen. I'm sorry if that's the case. But we can also check and say, hey, you know, is this author just off the beam saying lots of things that are contradicted by other very well-established sources? So we'll have to talk about that. What are the possibilities with this kind of external evidence? I think there are three large classes of possibilities. Uh, first of all, we could have what we would say is congruence or confirmation. Did I just jump backwards? Yes. Trying, testing. <laughs> okay, so confirmation would be a case where external sources agree with, or maybe even better, interlock with points in the text. This is really funny. This is like jumping on me, okay. Uh, that would be great, that would be the best case scenario. Second kind of possibility is that they conflict with or contradict. They're inconsistent with claims made in the text. Obviously, that's the not so good side. And then the third kind is silence. Right? What happened? Boy, sorry, still playing games with that. I went right past, didn't it? This is fun. Yeah, silence. External sources say nothing with regard to the events mentioned in the text. And then we have the question well, how much weight should we put on the silence? Arguments from silence in history are very interesting and tricky things. I'm going to try to support three claims tonight. First, I'm going to try to support the claim that there are numerous points of contact where the Gospels and Acts are confirmed by our other sources of historical information. Some of you may want to dispute that. That's fine. But I'm just going to say one thing about the way that I'm going to argue this. 
Um, at no point am I going to make any appeal to any theological belief. At no point am I going to assume that these writings are inspired. This is a purely historical argument. Let it stand or fall with the external publicly available evidence. Second, and in the same spirit, I'm going to argue that many of the alleged discrepancies between our external information and the Gospels and Acts are actually not discrepancies at all. It's no point of my argument to say that there are no discrepancies. There may be, but anyone who knows anything about secular history realizes that we've got vast disagreements among sources pretty close up to the facts in secular history. My purpose tonight is simply to bring this to the level of historical reliability of some of the best secular histories for the events that they record. Third, I'm going to argue that when we find silence in the external historical record, we have no good reason to expect anything else. Therefore, the silence is not going to be a good argument against the historical reliability of these texts. That's a lot to do, and I have a lot to say. So somebody tell me right now, what time do I need to be wrapping up? Does anybody know? I'm done! Yeah, thank you. It's whenever I'm done? Okay. Uh, so hang on tight. Uh, external evidence. This is a pretty severe test, and the reason that we know it's severe is that we know quite a lot about Palestine in the first century, thanks to the Jewish historian Josephus. In particular, we know that the political situation was very complicated. Uh, it had a double system of taxation. It had a double administration of justice. There's a, there's a, a Roman uh, military, and there's also a Jewish military. And in some degree, uh, there, there's double, double courts. This is a very complicated situation. How did that even come about? Well, Palestine passed under Roman control at the request of and with the consent of a large proportion of the population. It was not conquered in the ordinary way. And because it was a peaceful transition to Roman power, the native inhabitants were given a certain measure of autonomy. That was not unlimited, it was always bounded. Think colonial India under the British Empire. Okay, so what that means is that you've got strange parallels where they sort of have a certain measure of control, but not complete. There are coins that are being minted that are just ordinary Roman coins, and then there are coins being minted specifically with reference to the Jewish population so as to try not to offend them by what they portray on the face. So there's this mixture of things. It's a very complicated situation. Moreover, from about the year 6 BC to the year, uh, that's roughly the year in which Jesus was born. I know you're thinking 6, shouldn't this be like 0 BC? There's a monk named Dionysius Exiguus. It's all his fault, but we won't talk about that now. So if you go between 6 BC and then 50 years later in the year 44, it's really complex. There's no similar period of English history that's this complicated. It starts as a single united kingdom under a native ruler. And then, as we know from Josephus and Tacitus and other historians, it becomes a set of principalities that uh, are broken down. Uh, let's see if I can make that. It like wants to pop and it doesn't. I'm blaming darker forces for this. <laughs> All right. So it's a set of principalities under native ethnarchs and tetrarchs. But then that state of affairs gets partly altered. It's a country that's in part under such principalities, but partly reduced to the level of a Roman province. And then it's a kingdom that's reunited once more under a single native ruler. And then finally, in the year 44, it is a country wholly reduced under Rome and governed by procurators who are dependent on the president of Syria. Anybody want to take a quiz once I jump past that slide? <laughs> I know what you're thinking. There's no way he's going to be able to jump past it fast enough. We'll get it all down. Um, so that's what we know from Josephus and other non-Christian sources. How do the New Testament sources line up with that? Well, let's see. A single kingdom under a native ruler. What do we find in Matthew chapter 2? Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king... Herod the Great was the king whose domain included all of the territories, not just Judea in the narrow sense,
but also uh, Samaria and Galilee and Iteria and Trachonitis and all of these outlying areas. So it was a very extensive kingdom. But then it became a set of principalities under native ethnarchs and tetrarchs. Well, what do we find there? Go just a little further in Matthew, Matthew 2.22. Joseph is uh, traveling back from Egypt when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod. Archelaus is one of those tetrarchs, but he doesn't get his father's whole kingdom. Antipas gets Galilee. Other sons of Herod the Great get other portions. So Herod was determined that none of his sons would equal his own magnificence. They would only get a portion of his kingdom. He was weird that way. And that's the nicest thing I can find to say about him, too. All right, then it was a country uh, in part containing such principalities and in part reduced to the condition of a Roman province. Well, that's Luke 3, where he's setting up the story of the ministry of John the Baptist, Jesus kinsman, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea. So that's a Roman position. Herod, that's Herod Antipas, being tetrarch of Galilee. His brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iteria and Trachonitis. And Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. Yeah, that's where you all get the city name. So, uh, but what next? Well, uh, it's a kingdom reunited once more under a native ruler, but we find this in Acts 12.1. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to church. What, there's a Herod who's a king? It wasn't he like out already a long time ago? Well, no, actually, Herod the king, uh, am I on that slide? It didn't go, is that it? Yay. Um, Herod was the grandson, Herod, this is Herod Agrippa the first, he was the grandson of Herod the Great. And in the last three years of his reign, he was granted by Rome the full extent of his grandfather's kingdom. And then, after he dies in the year 44, it's a country wholly reduced under Rome and governed by procurators. And you'll remember from the book of Acts, the trials of Paul, how he's first imprisoned under the governorship of Antonius Felix. And then later, he is tried formally before Portius Festus. So the names that are given here, the descriptions that are given here, all line up. That's a pretty good track record for such a complicated period of history. If these were documents written much later by people who never knew Jesus, never knew anyone who knew Jesus, it's really pretty remarkable that they got it down that well. And here's something that we need to remember. It's very hard for us to remember this. There's no Wikipedia. You can't Google it. You can't just go look this up and say, oh, well, you know, I'm writing a novel. Let me see. I'll just trot down to the library and, and look that up. It's not there. So this suggests, though it certainly does not prove, that these people are well informed. Let's get into more details, though. In the Gospels, I'd like to look at eight points of confirmation. If I can get this to advance, I will anyway. Uh, in Matthew 2.22, we've also already seen that name Archelaus. I'd like to come back and talk about that. In Matthew 27.19, we're going to see a little detail about Pilate's wife. It's kind of interesting. We'll talk about the geography of Palestine in Mark 7, Jewish law in Mark 10. Soldiers, curiously enough, on active duty during a time of peace in Luke 3. Something about a Roman coin, the denarius in Luke 20. And in John 4, the Samaritans and their temple. There's a very curious verse there that we'll talk about. And in John 5, the pool of Bethesda. So let's move through this pretty quickly. Those of you who are thinking, wow, eight points. No, 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 that's just the beginning. We're, we're, we're barely getting off the ground here. Please make sure that your uh, tray tables are locked and your seats are in their full upright position. All right, one guy we're gonna rely on very heavily here is Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian who was captured by the Romans during the War of the Jews and turned to their side, became a translator for them, predicted that Vespasian would become emperor and when that did in fact happen, the Romans honored him and he was given you know, villas and lands and, and scribes to come and help him write his history of his own people in the Greek language. This is the best commentary that you're ever going to see on the New Testament because it's a non-Christian writer who's actually a contemporary, born about the time the Apostle Paul was converted, living in Palestine, knowing Jerusalem intimately, knowing Galilee intimately. He was a governor in Galilee. This is a guy who knows the times of which he speaks. 
His interests are not always the same as the interests of the Christians, but there's an awful lot of cross-comparison that we can do. So let's go on to Matthew 2.22. There's a very curious detour mentioned here. Joseph, Jesus' father, has heard that Herod the Great is dead. And that was the great danger to Jesus. That's why they fled the environs of Jerusalem in the first place. But he's on the road back from Egypt, coming back up into Palestine. And then verse 22 says, But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. So here's a puzzle. Since Herod the Great was dead, it would make sense that his eldest son would take the throne, or at least take a prominent part of the kingdom, and Judea was the central place in the kingdom, the heart of the kingdom from which Herod the Great had himself ruled. So Joseph knows that Herod's dead. He could pretty much infer that Archelaus would be ruling. Why does this come to him as if it were news? And why does it cause him to change plans? Couldn't he put two and two together? Well, there was actually news about Archelaus. Herod the Great had died, and Archelaus had taken his place not long before March of the year 4 BC, and that's just before Passover time. Josephus says between two and three million Jews came to Jerusalem every year at Passover. Let's suppose for the sake of argument that he's exaggerating a little, and it was merely hundreds of thousands. That's still an awful lot of pilgrims. Well. Herod had done something very unpopular just before he died. Some Jews had felt he was profaning the temple by having Roman shields with Roman eagles emblazoned on them hung over the gate of the temple. And they set some young men up to coming by night and chopping the shields down. He was infuriated. He found out who had done it. and He had them put to death for sedition. The Jews didn't look at this as sedition. They looked at this as just defending their religious rights. This was the buzz as the pilgrims came in to Jerusalem for the week-long Passover feast. And the word went around, and the Jews got really angry. A large group of Jews carrying their sacrifices, Josephus tells us, got into a fight with a small cohort of Roman soldiers. The Jews stoned the soldiers. Most of them died. And then the perpetrators picked up their sacrifices and ran into the temple. They're on holy ground. I'm on base can't touch me. Besides, you don't even know who I was. Archelaus, barely having assumed his father's position, not even having had a chance yet to go to Rome to get it verified, panicked. He sent a troop of armed horsemen to surround the temple with strict orders, do not let anyone outside go in, do not let anyone inside go out. And then he sent troops directly into the temple and he slaughtered 3,000 Jews. He canceled Passover. He told the Jews to go home. Now, back to Joseph, who's on his way up toward Jerusalem. And here come Passover pilgrims, would be Passover pilgrims, fleeing Jerusalem. And do you think that there's something that they're telling people that they meet? Archelaus has taken his father's throne and he's profaned the temple and slain Jews there. He's spilled blood in the holy places. Josephus tells us about the event. It's not hard to connect it now to what Joseph is hearing. And he thinks to himself, let's see, fled Judea to escape a homicidal maniac. I'm now headed back up there and there's a brand new homicidal. You know what? Galilee. I've got a place up in Galilee. Who's ruling that? Well, it turns out it's not Archelaus. It's Herod Antipas, one of the younger sons of Herod the Great, who has no such blood on his hands. And now that verse in Matthew that's just done in passing, there's no other mention of Archelaus in the entire scripture. But now it comes out in 3D. Now we can see it in its historical context, and Joseph's decision suddenly makes sense. There's a particular reason to avoid Archelaus. Let's jump ahead in Matthew's Gospel to Matthew chapter 27. There's a verse that I bet even those of you who are very devout and attend church services regularly have never heard a sermon preached on. It's Matthew 27, 19. Pilate has these Jews trying to get him to commit this guy to death, and he can't really see why he should. And in the middle of it all, what does he need? His wife sends him a message. 
Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. And you can just imagine his saying, this is what I needed. I needed my wife to have a dream about it. <laughs> but wait, there's more. Isn't this a mistake? Because we know from Diocasius that Caesar Augustus had set up strict rules forbidding the wives of provincial governors in the Roman Empire to accompany their husbands. In fact, not only did the wives have to stay behind in Rome, the husbands couldn't even visit them in Rome except during wintertime. That was the rule of Caesar Augustus. So haven't we caught Matthew in a mistake here? A little bit of embellishment maybe to make the narrative more vivid. No, actually we haven't. Uh, Cornelius Tacitus, the Roman historian, tells us something very interesting in book three of his Annals, chapters 33 and 34. It turns out that that rule of Augustus was widely disregarded during the reign of his successor, Tiberius. And in fact, in the early 20s, uh, Tiberius had only been in charge for seven years or so, um, Cacanus actually brought a motion before the Roman Senate to start enforcing once again that prohibition, and he got voted down. So actually, what might have been a mistake there in the narrative turns out to be exactly true to the time and the place in which the narrative is set. Some of you may be thinking, yeah, OK, you got one or two things right there. But you know, yeah, what a, how does that prove anything about the resurrection or all those saints who are supposed to have come out of their graves in Matthew 27 and all that? And here's all that I'm claiming. When a document or a set of documents can be shown to have gotten numerous things right, unless there's some countervailing evidence, ordinary historical practice is to extend them prima facie credit. Maybe you've got a specific reason for denying it in a particular case, but we extend general credit to those that show themselves to be trustworthy. Why? Because they don't know what we have the means of checking up. These guys writing these documents didn't know, well, it would be safe to put that in there because some Roman historian is going to come along another you know, half century or so on, and he's going to write something that will confirm it, and then they'll know that. They don't know what we know. They can't tell what we can check up on. They just write what they write, and we check up on certain things because we have the available means. That's all I'm arguing for here. Let's do another one, and this one's kind of fun. The way from Tyre to Galilee. Mark 7, 31. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon, to the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. Now here's the trouble with this one. You see, Tyre is on the coast. And the way, I can't see if that's working. The way from Tyre to Sidon, did an arrow show up there yet? Yeah. Yay. Okay, that's north, right? But the Decapolis, you see, is down south. It's on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. So why wouldn't you just go there directly instead of making this detour, right? If somebody said, and Tim went from Waco to College Station by way of Dallas, you would say something's wrong, right? That would just seem weird. And critics have not been slow to accuse Mark of just really bungling the geography of this. So here's a critical verdict from a recent commentary. Many interpreters have noted this awkward route as evidence that Mark was unfamiliar with the geography of Palestine and Galilee. It seems difficult to believe that a person living in Galilee who is educated enough to produce a gospel, such as Mark, would be unfamiliar with the geographical relationship between Tyre and Sidon. Hey, that's a nice one, right? We caught him, and we even have modern scholars seeing it and noting it. Let's take a closer look at that geography. Here, um, we may really rue those floodlights, but if I can make it show up here, I have a topographical map. Can you all see different colored regions on that map? No. All right, then. Let's see. There is. If you look, uh, can you see the word Upper Galilee? Okay. Right below that, there's a number, which is probably partly washed out. That number is 1208. This is a topographical map, and that's the elevation in meters. That's a lot of meters. And if you do hiking, right, you, you know what just like a 3% grade can feel like when you're hiking, right? It doesn't look like much when you draw it on paper, but when you're walking up it, you can feel it. So yeah, sure enough, if we uh, take 
a picture of this from the coast. There's a mountain, three quarters of a mile high, directly in between Tyre and Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. But wait, what do you see happening on the left side of that image? What's happening with the mountain? It's dropping down toward a pass there, isn't it? And so if you're looking east here, then going up over along the coast toward a place where you could cut through that pass would be going north. But that's where Sidon is, and sure enough, Right at Sidon, there's a pass between Mount Maron and the Golan Heights and the other uh, great heights over on that side that allows you to come right down to the northern part of the River Jordan, which means that for the rest of your journey down, you have fresh water all the way down. Have any of you visited Israel? You kind of need water, don't you? All right, maybe Mark got that one right, but now we're really going to nail him. Mark 10, 12 gives Jesus' teaching, and it's very interesting because we've got bits and pieces of Jesus' teaching on this subject in other Gospels, but Mark has this bit that nobody else has. It says of a woman that if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. But here's the funny thing. Jewish law in Deuteronomy 24 makes provision for a man to divorce his wife. It makes no provision for a woman to divorce her husband. So various theories have been floated. Maybe Mark was a Gentile who betrayed his ignorance of Jewish law. Maybe he creatively redacted Jesus' teaching in order to make it more applicable to an audience of people who weren't Jews. So let's let some critics state the objection in their own words. This sentence is generally regarded as an addition to Jesus' teaching that was made to address situations related to Roman legal practice, whereby a woman could initiate divorce proceedings. That's the mildest of things that could be said. Hey, you know, Mark is just taking some liberties, but that's okay because we want to make this fresh and relevant to each audience, right? Now, back to that Jewish historian Josephus. Josephus tells us that Herodias, who was the wife of Philip, the half-brother of Herod Antipas, took it upon herself to confound the laws of our country and divorced her first husband in order to marry Herod Antipas who was the ruler in Galilee at the very time that Jesus is speaking. In other words, when Jesus talks about a woman divorcing her husband and marrying another, he's not talking hypothetically. He's talking about the ruling couple in Galilee where he's talking right then. How much more tightly can you nail this into the historical context than that? And yet, we still have commentators who apparently need to become acquainted with Josephus. They haven't done their homework. That's two from Matthew, two from Mark. Let's go into Luke. So, in Luke 3.14, we get the story. John the Baptist is baptizing in the Jordan, and all kinds of people are coming down to him. Generally, he receives them well. Then some of the Jewish rulers come out, and he's really hard with them. But in the middle of it all, some soldiers march into the story. Soldiers also asked him, and we... What shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or by false accusation and be content with your wages, which suggests that the principal vices to which soldiers were prone were force and force, and their principal gripe was money and money. <laughs> but there's a problem. This is a time of peace. Why does Luke depict these soldiers as men on active duty? This is an active participle. They are soldiering. They're not just guys who, you know, uh, retired. They're not veterans. These guys are on active duty. All through Galilee, there is peace. You might not like the peace all that much, but it is Pax Romana. The bandits have been largely cleared out of the hills. What's going on with that? Well, I'm so glad you asked. You see, remember that uh, Herodias defied the laws of her country and divorced her husband? Well, Herod Antipas had a wife at that point, too. She was the daughter of Aretas IV, king of Araparia. And she ran home to daddy. And daddy was not amused. So Aretas began a border war all up along the length of his kingdom, which extended far north to the eastern edge of Herod Antipas's kingdom and all the way down the River Jordan. And so Antipas had now suddenly to defend this wide front against raids and incursions 
from Aretas. And so we know from jo Josephus that he hired mercenaries and sent them from Galilee down southward to the corner of the Dead Sea where he had a fortress called Macarus. And they garrisoned that fortress and it was from that fortress that then he projected his military power in the fight against Aretas. For those of you who are history geeks, this does not end well for Herod Antipas. A large group of his soldiers get caught in an ambush and utterly destroyed. Such a little thing, soldiering. They're on active duty. Luke gets it right. Let's do another one from Luke. Sorry, there we go. Are we there now? Yes. The denarius, this is a Roman coin. Do you remember the scene, it's in Luke 20 and Matthew 22, where the Jewish rulers come to trap Jesus and they do it with this infallible trap. It's about taxes. The Jewish people hate paying these taxes. Amen. <laughs> Knew I could get a text to say amen out of that. Yeah, um, I th think some things never change. And so if they could align Jesus with the Roman taxation, they'd seriously undercut his popularity with the population. On the other hand, if he says, no, don't pay taxes, they just need to whistle for the nearest Roman soldiers. Hey, this guy's telling us to disobey Caesar. You're not down with that, right? Foolproof. It's brilliant. And it fails. He says, show me a denarius. Whose likeness and inscription does it have? And something has gone terribly wrong. Suddenly, these guys who had this foolproof dilemma are staring at their sandal straps. Caesar's, he said to them, then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Well, let's look at that denarius. We actually have one. Notice he doesn't just say, bring me a coin, bring me some money. He says a denarius so we can look at it. You may not be able to see the image very well on the screen, but perhaps you can make out the fact that it's got somebody's face on it. That's Tiberius Caesar. It's his likeness on it. Yeah, he's a handsome guy, isn't he? That's his schnoz there and, uh, and his curly locks. So, sorry ladies, he's not single. But, remember why the Jews were rioting right after the death of Herod the Great, shields with an image of an eagle had been placed in Jerusalem. Why was that a big deal? It's because of the second commandment in Exodus 20, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. This looks like something that is in the earth beneath. And so he's got them and he's got them doubly because he says who's image does it bear? That word in Greek is the same Greek word that the Jews themselves use when they translate their own scriptures into Greek in Genesis 1. And do you remember what it's used for there? Man is made what? In the image of God, right? So he's got them dead on the second commandment. You guys are, are freaking out about even marginal violations of the second commandment and you want to covet this? I always noticed that and I thought that was great, but you know what, that's not even the best part about this because Jesus doesn't just say whose image does it bear, he also says whose inscription does it bear. And if you look at that image, starting over by the uh, left hand side by his ear and then reading uh, counterclockwise around it, it says in an abbreviated way, Augustus Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. That's right. This coin, by its inscription, is celebrating the worship of the previous Roman emperor as a god. So from a Jewish perspective, this is not just a violation of the second commandment. This is a violation of the first. Sometimes, as I'm teaching, topics of religion come up, and if they're not really pertinent to class, I never dwell on them. But one thing that I have said sometimes is whatever else you may think of Jesus, he was one of the most brilliant human beings who ever walked the earth. It is not surprising that several Gospels report by the end of the day when this event happened, nobody else dared to ask him any further questions. Okay, well, that's the Synoptic Gospels, but, you know, then there's John. 
right? And John's a spiritual gospel. John's not a gospel that we have to take seriously because it's all full of fanciful stuff. Well, let's check. Let's, let's check and see. Here's a uh, passage from John chapter 4. Those of you who attended Sunday school, whether you're now atheists or Christians, may remember that's the story of the woman at the well. So the woman says to him, Sir, he's just told her more than she would like anyone to know about her personal life. Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. She points to Mount Gerizim. It's visible from Jacob's well. But you, you Jews, say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. And if he just stopped there and then went into all of the worship him in spirit and in truth stuff, that would be great. But have you ever heard a sermon on verse 22? You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. What's that? Just a little bit of gratuitous cultural chauvinism slipped into the gospel for the fun of it? (laughs) What is going on? That is a weird Sentence, and there is nothing to explain it anywhere else in John or, frankly, in Scripture. But we can explain it. The Samaritans, you see, uh, had named their temple for a Greek god to appease Antiochus IV. It's a funny story. They were afraid he was going to catch them sort of between the hammer and the anvil as he came down to sack Jerusalem. And so they wrote in this note and said to Antiochus, the God, you know, we are not Jews, we're Sidonians. It's true that we keep the Sabbath, but that really doesn't have anything to do with that Jewish thing. And, and oh, by the way, we have a temple, but our temple doesn't even have a name. And we're wondering if you'd mind if in your honor, because Antiochus thought he was the incarnation of Zeus, would you mind if we named it the temple of Zeus? And according to Josephus in Antiquities book 12, chapter five, Antiochus wrote back and he said, very well, do that. And they did. And he bypassed them and he came down and he hammered Jerusalem. Kind of puts Jesus' comment into context, doesn't it? Your fathers worshipped in this mountain. Really? Remind me, what did they worship? What was the name of your temple again? We took the hit. We remained faithful. Don't tell me what you worshipped in this mountain. And the story suddenly comes out in three dimensions. Let's do one more out of John, the Pool of Bethesda in John 5, just mentioned in passing. It's the setup for a healing that Jesus does. There is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades or walkways. Now, Alfred Loisy was a well-known critic at the beginning of the 20th century, and his view on this is a view that is still endorsed today in many New Testament commentaries. The ancients, he said, who hoped to find in the source a Jewish symbol, and in the five porches, an allusion to the five books of the law, undoubtedly discovered the thought of the evangelist. Do you see what he's saying? It's all a metaphor. It means the law. And here was this man who had been, metaphorically, under the law. And the law could do nothing for him. Oh, but then along comes Jesus, and Jesus does for him what the law could not do. The whole miracle aspect of it, nah, don't take that seriously. Uh, This is all metaphorical. Well, archaeological work at the Pool of Bethesda in 56 revealed that it was located near the Sheep Gate, just as John says, and that it was surrounded by four roofed colonnades and spanned across the middle by a fifth. I asked my colleague, John Meyer, uh, what was going on with that, and he said, I've been there. John, or sorry, Paul Meyer, I should say. Paul, uh, Paul not only taught ancient history, um, he taught ancient history at Western Michigan for 50 years at his retirement party. The standing joke was that he actually knew Pontius Pilate. <laughs> okay, that's the Gospels. And you thought I was done, but I'm not. We're going to move on to the book of Acts, because I promised you I would say something about the book of Acts. Colin Hamer, a historian who died tragically young, in his book, The Book of Acts in the Setting of Hellenistic History, takes about 50 pages to go through the last 16 chapters of Acts, almost verse by verse, and he finds 84 specific facts from those 16 chapters confirmed 
by historical and archaeological research. I am not going to give you all 84 because I have more to say. But let's just take a look at some of the breadth of the things that he gets right. So he gets ports at Seleucia and Cyprus and Perga and the proper crossings between them. He gets the proper location of Iconium in Phrygia rather than Lycaonia, which had actually been thought to be an error on the part of the Book of Acts until onomastic evidence demonstrated that actually the borderlines were drawn in a way that makes Luke accurate on that. Sailors' landmarks. There's a mountain at Samothrace that's 5,000 feet high, almost a mile high, easily visible from sea. He mentions that in passing. The best shipping lanes traveling uh, along the open sea past the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia to Myra in Acts 27. But more, there's more. There's the Lycaonian language. Have we got, did I move on to the next? Yeah, in Lystra there was a special language spoken and we've been able to verify this uh, from archeological evidence. Local deities at Lystra, Zeus and Hermes, were indeed the local deities as we've been able to uncover archeologically. Local industries, Thyatira is a center of dying. Please remember there's no Google. There's no Wikipedia. The description of Philippi as a Roman colony and the correct identification of its seaport as Neapolis. But there's more. There's Athenian slang terminology. Did I jump yet? Yeah, the, the spermologos is a word for a seed picker. It refers to a bird that comes down and picks up some seed and flies off. That's a, a slang term that's used as a description of Paul. Who is this seed picker? We know that that's Athenian slang. We can actually find Athenians using it around the time. It's a characteristic term there, but not elsewhere. The Lycaonian language spoken in Lystra, let's, whoops, did I double that? I did. Let's go on to another one. Oh, yeah, um, further examples. Here we go, some titles. The governor of Cyprus is uh, called the Anthipatos. He's the proconsul. But in Philippi, which is a free colony, they're strategoi. They're governors. That's a free city. And in Thessalonica, Thessalonica they are the politarchi. They're the rulers. And over in Ephesus, there are no parlotarchi. In Ephesus, there's a grammatus. He's the town clerk. But on the island of Malta, there's just a chief guy, a protos. Each of these titles is distinctive to the area. Each of them has been verified by inscriptional and other archaeological evidence. We actually found an archway in Thessalonica with the polotarchi, some of them even named and listed. These are just examples. There are many more things I could give you. And again, if I were arguing here tonight for the inerrancy or the infallibility of the text, I could understand a certain measure of skepticism, saying, well, don't, you know, you're, you're piling up some examples, fine, we'll give you those, but what else? I'm not arguing for that. I'm arguing that this is a historically reliable text in the sense that I defined it at the beginning. I'm trying to make a cumulative case for that. Okay, but most of that was just the positive evidence. How about hearing the other side? Great, let's do it. Let's look at some alleged historical errors. So, where are we here? Sorry, I can't see what that slide says. Oh, I didn't go down that way. We're trying. You want to just bump it? Uh, now it's starting. I think it's starting to be sensitive to it. Yay. I got that far. There we are. So I want to do um, three of these out of Matthew and Mark, and then we'll move on to Luke and John. Um, and I'm going to try to cover some of the major ones. Probably some of you sitting here are going to say, well, darn it, you didn't do my favorite one. Great. That's what the question and answer period is for. So if I don't hit your favorite, hit me with it. Okay? Uh, so Mark 5, there's the story of the swine. Mark 11, the location of Bethany and Bethphage. And then Matthew 8, there's the story of those Gadarene swine again. So what's up with that? Let's look at that. So Mark 5, 1 through 13 says, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. Now, what's the problem? Well, you see, we know where Gerasa is. And if I do this right, a little arrow will appear. Yes? No? Not yet? This is one of those ones where I just can't see it until I get it right. Showing? Yeah. Um, 
that's a long way from the Sea of Galilee, right? That's uh, about 37 miles. So here's the difficulty. Gerasa, or modern Jerash, is not on the other side of the sea. It's located far south of the Sea of Galilee. I don't think that's what the story intends. So has Mark just blundered about the geography of Palestine? Hold that thought. We'll come back to that. Let's look at Mark 11.1. 1. Now that when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples. Ah, wait, wait. If you're traveling to Jerusalem, you would come to Bethany first. Then you would come to Bethphage. Ha, does Mark give the wrong order for someone traveling from Jericho to Jerusalem? Again, this is not a, a criticism of my invention. Here's the statement from Randall Helms. Some of you may enjoy some of Randall's work. How many of you have heard of Randall Helms' gospel fictions, any of those other works? Okay, a few people out there have read their skeptic classics. Good. Uh, he's somebody who gets quoted by Richard Dawkins in The God, God Delusion. Anyone approaching Jerusalem from Jericho would come first to Bethany and then to Bethphage, not the reverse. This is one of several passages showing that Mark knew little about Palestine. We must assume, Dennis Nynum argues, that Mark did not know the relative positions of these two villages on the Jericho Road. Nynum was a real and serious British New Testament scholar, and he is quoted accurately there from his work on St. Mark. Let's read that verse again. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples. Does that say that they came to Bethphage first and then to Bethany? No, it doesn't say that. Well, how far apart are these towns? Turns out they're about half a mile from one another. Not quite close enough to be able to hit one with the other with a football, but not very far. This is just a marker to the approximate location on the slopes of the Mount of Olives where they had come when Jesus sent two people ahead. This is not a travel itinerary where you're going to transfer planes in Bethphage and then on to Bethany. So I think there's just some very serious overreading necessary there to create the illusion that there's actually a geographical error. But speaking of geographical errors, let's go back to the matter of those pigs. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes. Now here's the weird thing about this one, okay? Uh, if I can get my arrows to work. Yay. Okay, there's Gadara, right? Now, so notice what's going on here. Matthew, it seems, places the event at Gadara, not in Gerasa, which is where Mark put it. So there's still a problem. It's still seven miles away from the Sea of Galilee, and no reasonable reading of the story is going to make seven miles the distance that the pigs had to run. So what do we do with a case like this? Now, really bluntly, it would be okay in ordinary history if we said, yeah, okay, so they screwed up the location, not a big deal. That would be a perfectly reasonable move if that's all the evidence that we had. We could stop there. But what if we can plausibly show that there's something better going on? Let's check the text very carefully. There are some textual variants here, and we want to look at those. So, in the Greek texts, we've got variations in Mark 5 and in the parallel texts in Matthew and in Luke. In Mark, the best attested reading is Gerasenes, which is an attempt to represent the adjective corresponding to the place name. But the place would have had an Aramaic name. And Aramaic is a language that generally got a triliteral root. There are three consonants that are form the root of the words, and then vowel pointings have to be put in. And so this would be transliterated as we would put it as GRS or KRS, really pretty much interchangeably. But if we check the map once again, we find that there is something that corresponds to that triliteral root, and that is Kersa, or modern Kersi, in either case from this KRS root. And Kersa 
is actually on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, where a steep hill runs right down. You can see I've got a picture of that hill. It's not trick photography. Um, you can even see the sort of level of the sea and a mountain at, at the outline in the back. Uh, from the other side of the lake, as you look over toward it, you can still see the steep hillside. Another view of it still. I've got a third picture here, if I can make it advance. There we go. Now, that's both locationally and topologically exactly the kind of location that we would expect. And for that reason, quite a number of modern scholars think that this is the actual location of it. Okay, still, but what about Gadarenes and Gadara? It seems probable that some early copyist of Matthew's Gospel either misspelled, misspelled Gadarenes or just mistook it for Gadarenes. Somebody might mistake, you know, two unfamiliar place names today. Ashtamo and Otsigo are both names of towns near Kalamazoo. We have a lot of Indian names for towns. Copyists of manuscripts aren't immune to making errors. We know this from all kinds of things. Uh, and they're not immune to fixing what they think is a misspelling, and sometimes the fixes are actually the errors. That's fine. That's ordinary <laughs> historical practice for us. This is the one some of you have been waiting for. We're going to move to Luke and we're gonna do it directly. According to Luke, so runs the objection, Caesar Augustus ordered a taxation of the whole Roman Empire during the reign of Herod the Great, but Augustus never did this, and he could not have ordered a census just in Herod's domain. Objection two, following up on that, Luke confuses this supposed census with one under Quirinius that took place about 12 years later. Objection three, Luke gives Pontius Pilate the wrong title, calling him procurator or hegemon instead of prefect in Luke 3. And there's more. Remember, it's widely acknowledged that the guy who wrote Luke is the guy who wrote Acts. We just saw that raft of evidence for Luke's painstaking accuracy. But hey, maybe we can attack him in the gospel and sort of get at him that way. Objection 4, Luke claims that Lysanias was alive in about the year 27. But in fact, Lysanias died around... 36 to 34 BC. Luke speaks of Annas and Caiaphas as high priests, but there was only ever one high priest at a time. Luke places a synagogue at Capernaum, but there was no synagogue there in Jesus' time. That's a pretty good indictment of Luke, isn't it? So, let's go on those one by one. Am I on objection one yet? Yes. All right. So here's Luke 2, verse 1. In those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered or enrolled. In the NIV, it says the entire Roman world. How many of you have a copy of the NIV? You have my permission to take a pen and scratch it across the word Roman. It has nothing corresponding to it in the Greek text. That is an interpretive decision made on the part of the translators to help you. In fact, it just messes you up. All right, so there wasn't any such, uh, any such uh, taxation. Well, what the verse actually says is the whole oikomene, whole land, like the, uh, the Hebrew haretz, was to be registered. And what's really important is that Luke uses this term and nearly the same construction in the book of Acts, Acts 11.28. There would be, it says there, a great famine over all the oikomene. But that great famine we know about from Josephus. It clearly means the land of Judea, not the whole Roman Empire. So we've got the same author using the same phrase, and we know in the second instance what he means. That is a reasonable argument that he may mean the same thing in the first occurrence of it, in a different work of his. But let's press that objection. Judea was under the control of Herod the Great. And as a client king in good standing, he would have been allowed to levy taxes himself. So Augustus would not have issued this decree. That's good if he was in good standing. But was he? Well, Josephus yet again, near the end of his reign, Herod fell out of favor with Augustus who sent him a sharply worded letter telling him, basically, I've treated you as a friend up to this point, but now I'm going to treat you as a subject. 
So whether formally or in effect, this is a demotion. You've been rex socius, now you're merely rex amicus. You've lost some of the authority you had as rex socius. From Josephus also, we learn, trying to make this go, that uh, at this time the Romans required an oath of allegiance to Caesar from the citizens. Some Pharisees wouldn't give that oath of allegiance and they were fined and a noble woman paid their fine and the Jews thought she was so great for doing that. Um, that would be a step in the reduction of Palestine from a kingdom to the status of a province. So Josephus doesn't say that there was a taxation, but he says that something happened which we really can't explain in any other way, but that would have been a first step in the whole process. But within a year or so, says Josephus, uh, Herod managed to get back into Augustus' good graces. So the summary of the answer to that objection, I think, is that the registra registration was probably only in Herod's dominion, not empire-wide, that it may have been ordered when Herod fell out of favor with Augustus around the year 7 BC. And this explanation covers the oath of loyalty to Caesar that Josephus mentions, which is otherwise unexplained. But that's not the objection that you really care about, right? If you're really a hardcore skeptic, you want to go on to Quirinius. Let's do it. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. He didn't become governor of Syria until 6 AD. That's 10 years after Herod the Great was dead. If somebody makes a chronological blunder that big, why should you trust him? I could answer and I could make a good case for it, that we have other good historians who occasionally make chronological blunders. Yes, sometimes even that great. But I don't think this is. Before we answer this objection, let's note some basic facts. First, Luke knows that Jesus was born during the reign of Herod the Great. He says so in Luke 1.5. He also knows about the taxation under Quirinius in the year six because Gamaliel mentions it in a speech in Acts 5.37. Any explanation we give of what Luke is doing in Luke 2, verses 1 and 2, has to be compatible with these facts. So here's a possible answer. I find it plausible. I think it's good enough to diffuse the claim of historical error. First, the Greek in this text does not actually claim that the well-known taxation under Quirinius took place in 6 BC. Here's what the Greek says if we look at it closely. I'm sorry for, the, again, the washout on the screen. I hope you'll be able to follow this. I hope I'll be able to follow it too. We jump? Yay. So the earliest Greek manuscripts we have show that the practice of the writing of Greek at the time was all in capital letters. And the capital letters were unaccented. So aute looks an awful lot like Haute. In fact, it looks identical when written in capital letters in Greek. So, per various good scholars like Ebrard and Gade, um, what this says is that the enrollment, the obligraphe, the registration itself, was first made when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, here's the curious thing. Um, the term apographe can mean either a registration, a signing up, or it can mean the kind of taxation that would follow upon that registration. By metonymy, the part became used for the whole, and not an uncommon thing linguistically. So what this means is that an admissible reading of Luke's Greek is that a decade or so after the census, the registration mentioned in Luke, Quirinius came in, Archelaus got deposed from his management, Quirinius came in and he said, all right, time to get some taxes out of these people, and uh, he brought the taxation itself, the taxation proper, to, a, to pass. I've already mentioned that Luke's use of okumene in Acts parallels the uh, proper reading. Am I jumping yet? No, this is trying, trying, praying for a miracle. Uh, did I jump too far? Yeah, let's go back. There we go. All right, so in Acts 11, 28, uh, there's a prophecy that there will be a great famine and that it will be over all the world. Hola ten oikomenein. Notice how close that is in construction to Luke 2, 1. Pasan ten oikomenein. The whole world, all the world, all the land, really, the region. And as I pointed out, we already knew this. But he also uses agenita 
in the same way, where he could just use ain. How many of you know some Greek? Come on, come on. Yeah, good, good for you. Um, so, um, Agenata is the same, this, which can be read, came to pass. It can also be used as a kind of stand-in for was. But Luke uses it here in almost, again, the same construction as in Luke 2. What are some consequences of this reading if we take this reading? Well, first of all, loose passing mention of the apographe in the time of Judas the Galilean, the one that comes up in Acts 5, doesn't have to be explained away. That just falls right in with the context. Second, Luke's brief reference to the registration corresponds to Josephus' allusion to an oath of allegiance to Caesar in Judea, and unless we explain it this way, we have no explanation for that. Finally, there's no need to predate the governorship of Quirinius. Some people are going to say Quirinius was governor twice. It's barely possible. But you don't even have to go there. I know that's a popular thing. It's like the one I think that's given in one of Lee Strobel's books. I find that just a lot less plausible than one that can be philologically nailed down by Luke's own language and by cross connections to Josephus of this kind. So all apparent chronological discrepancies disappear. So summary of that, that was long and complicated. So let me try to give it to you just in a, in a quick form here. There we are. Plausibly, and I'm not arguing this is certain, okay, I'll be reasonably modest, but plausibly Luke intends to convey that although the census was aborted in the year 6 BC, it was picked up and carried through to its logical conclusion, the taxation itself, haute, under Quirinius. And with that, I think we finish that objection. Some of you may say, 12 years later, that's a long time. Man, you can't take 12 years to do a taxation. Oh, yeah? How long did it take the Romans to do a taxation in Gaul? 40 years. 12 years is nothing compared to that. So objection number three, remember how Luke begins uh, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, etc. Oh, wait, 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 wait. He's not technically a governor. He's a prefect. You don't have the right term there. Well, let's see. It's not a technical term for prefect, and before the year 44, the governor was technically a prefect, but the more general term Luke uses is the common one, and we can demonstrate this from non-Christian sources. So, Josephus repeatedly uses hegemon to describe Pilate and his predecessors in the same position, same word that Luke is using for them. Tacitus, the Roman historian, describes Pontius Pilate as one of our procurators. So a certain amount of semantic flexibility in the use of this term was common at that time. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to say Luke screwed up if everybody else used the term that flexibly as well. Uh, but wait, wait, We're, we've got a historical problem now, right? Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. Well, but we can get him on this one, can't we? See. Um, According to Josephus, Lysanias was tetrarch of Abila to about the year 36 BC, maybe a little bit later, but not enough to be hanging around in the year 27 AD. 60 years off, what do you think? Well, you know, it is just barely possible for two people to have the same name. Doesn't mean that Lysanias and the tetrarchy of Abila or Abilene means that they have to be the same person. And in fact, we have very good reason for thinking they were not because of an inscription found on a temple from the time of Tiberius. Tiberius, the emperor throughout most of Jesus' life. It dates from 14 to 29 AD, and it names a guy Lysanias as the Tetrarch of Abila, just like Luke says. The inscription itself is interesting. It says, for the salvation of the august lords and of their household, Nymphaeus, freedmen of eagle Lysanias Tetrarch, established this street and other things. What's that, the august lords? Well, that is a joint title 
given only to the emperor Tiberius and the widow of his predecessor. They were referred to as an honorific as the August Lords. And that establishes the date of the inscription as being between 14, that's the year Augustus dies, and the year 29, when Livia died. You wouldn't inscribe something to the August Lords unless they're both alive. So there was a different Lysanias who was Tetrarch of Abilene right in the time that Luke indicates. Objection five, Luke three. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, but wait, but wait, you can't have that. Any person acquainted with the history and polity of the Jews must have known that there was never but one high priest at a time. Okay, has Luke just messed up on this? You know, he was a Gentile anyway. Maybe he just didn't know this Jewish stuff and he's been caught out here. Well, what do we know about this? Annas, or Ananas, as he's sometimes called, had held the office of high priest until the year 15. But Gratus, Valerius Gratus, Pilate's predecessor, deposed him because he didn't like something he had done, and he started appointing one after another high priests of his own choosing. So the Jews apparently accommodated the Roman in interference by speaking of both the current Roman appointee and the original ritually appointed Jewish priest as high priests, which would sound like I'm making that up if I just said it and I didn't document it. So have a look at Josephus' own language. In the Jewish War, Book 2, Chapter 12, Section 6, and both Jonathan and Ananias, the high priests, one of them, high priest for life in Jewish eyes, the other, the guy the Romans will acknowledge as the high priest, he himself uses this kind of locution to accommodate the interference that the Romans were making upon the Jewish system. I think that adequately answers the fifth objection. And I'm not done yet. Are you sorry yet? <laughs> All right, get some more beer. It's gonna be a long night. But if I'm going to make a cumulative case, I can't just give you three or four things and say, therefore, believe me about all the rest. A cumulative case takes a lot of evidence. So let's keep moving. Luke 7 talks about a synagogue in Capernaum. This centurion, they say, is the one who built us our synagogue. Now that suggests not only that there is a synagogue in Capernaum, but that it's a pretty decent one, right? They're not saying he built us this lousy synagogue. Can you believe what a cheapskate the guy is? There's something about it that's worthy of being referred to in terms of respect and that should itself draw Jesus' sympathy out to do a favor for the centurion. Well, you know, Robert M. Price. How many of you have heard of Bob Price? Right. He's your man for some of you, I know. That's fine. A major collision between the gospel tradition and archaeology concerns the existence of synagogues and Pharisees in pre-70 Galilee historical logic implies that there would not have been any since Galilee's, Pharisees fled to Galilee only after the fall of Jerusalem. But no synagogues, too. Hmm. Well, what are the implications of that statement? That it was a pretty impressive structure. And other passages make it plain that Capernaum was Jesus' principal base of operations in Galilee. So if the gospel authors are placing Jesus in Galilee as his main base of operations, and if there isn't a synagogue there, and Luke says there is, and in fact, others have him going in and out of synagogues in Galilee, probably that one, then they have a problem. Somebody has a problem. Archaeologists have actually uh, been doing excavations at Capernaum. And if I can make this advance, we'll get it. There we go. So here's James Strange and Herschel Shanks in their article, Synagogue Where Jesus Preached Found at Capernaum. The first century synagogue where Jesus preached has probably been found. And I'll spare you reading the rest of that because the next slide is actually more fun. We have pictures. Come on now. Yeah. All right. So this is Trench 25 at Capernaum. You can see limestone walls. That's a fourth or fifth century synagogue. That's the one they found first. They were like, yeah, that has nothing to do with Jesus. But then beneath the limestone walls, there's another darker layer of stone and it's labeled B here. And that layer is made of basalt. 
That's the first century synagogue. And in fact, below that, right down at the bottom, we have the pavement, a cobbled pavement. And that's also from the first century. You know how we find out that stuff like that is from the first century? This is great. Workmen drop coins into the cement and they get embedded and left there. I love being able to date stuff that way. Actually, it was just fundamentalists and Zionist Jews planting them there in order to attract tourism. <laughs> All right. Here's something else. The walls of that first century synagogue, that basalt one, they continue out beyond the level of the limestone. That's just laid down on part of them. And they're over a meter thick. They're really unusually thick walls. The floor plan shows that it was a building with an interior space that was about half again the size of any other synagogue we have discovered in Galilee. That fits very nicely with the implication in Luke 7 that the synagogue was particularly magnificent. It was something that was really a worthy structure. That covers two of the three kinds of connection we might find in history, positive and ostensible negative. And I, I know some of you have other negative things that you want to bring up. We'll get to the Q&A in a little while, but first, let's hear the sounds of silence. That argument from silence, what happens when something's mentioned and dang it, the other people just don't talk about it. All right, so let's go to Matthew 2 for this one. All those innocents, right? So here's the problem. We don't hear about their slaughter in any other gospel. It's not mentioned in Josephus. He gives a lot of information about the career of Herod the Great, including nasty things Herod the Great did. Why wouldn't he talk about this? So our question is, how much weight should we give to silence like that? How much weight should that carry? How many of you have seen David Fitzgerald's book, Nailed? If you take away the argument from silence from David Fitzgerald, what does he have left? Let's try to do it here. First, though, let's try to get a grip on how the argument runs. I think it's something like this. If the slaughter of the innocents had really happened, as Matthew describes it, we would have other first century sources that mention it. We don't, so it didn't. Premise two is true. We don't have other sources. But is premise one reasonable? Is the if-then statement a reasonable statement? I don't think so. I think. This argument from silence is weak, and here are a couple of the reasons. First, most of the literature from Palestine in the first century has been lost. If someone else wrote about this event, there's little reason to think that we would still have his work. Moreover, most of what we do have doesn't concern Judea and doesn't concern the political events in it. Columella wrote a treatise on planting trees. He's not going to talk to us about this. Petronius wrote a satire for Nero to amuse him. It's about port life around the Mediterranean, and it's very racy. This event isn't going to show up in that. There's just not much. Second and very important, Bethlehem was a small town. Probably half a dozen infant boys fell under the description here. Third, um, Josephus, even if he knew about it, probably wouldn't have bothered to record it because it made no difference to the life of the great. Josephus, like virtually every other Roman and Greek historian, is concerned with the life of the elite. And this doesn't affect the passage of the throne. This affects nothing. It's just, it's certainly holy in character with Herod. But there's no particular reason to think that Josephus would have done this. You say, well, that sounds like special pleading. Can you illustrate that from other historical events? Yes, we can. Josephus and Philo, Jewish writers in the first century, both pass over the expulsion of the Jews from Rome by Claudius. It's mentioned in the second century by a Roman historian, Suetonius. You would think that something that happened to the Jewish people at the center of the empire would matter to these Jewish intellectuals. They don't mention it. The only mention, in fact, that we get in a first century text is in the book of Acts. Despite Josephus' silence, all historians acknowledge that the event took place. No first century historian or any source that we now possess 
tells us about, am I on, on to the next slide yet? Okay, N tells us about the destruction of two towns, Herculaneum and Pompeii, in the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in the year 79. Pliny the Younger tells us all about the eruption, how his uncle tried to rescue people, how his uncle got killed. It just doesn't mention that any towns got destroyed by the flowing lava. Nobody infers from Pliny's silence that the event did not take place. Here's another argument from silence. Am I on to the Mark passage yet? One more. One more? There we go. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now, Edward Gibbon, the historian of the 18th century, uh, in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, says something very interesting. He says, a distinct chapter of Pliny is devoted to eclipses of an extraordinary nature and unusual duration. But Pliny does not mention this darkness. So if there really was a darkness, how could Pliny have missed it? There's an argument from silence, and Gibbon is really rubbing our faces in it, isn't he? Well, let's check, okay? First of all, Pliny didn't live in Judea at this time. Second, the darkness couldn't have been due to a solar eclipse. Why not? When is Passover? It's the time of the greatest light, which is the time of the first full moon after the vernal equinox. But the time of a full moon can't be the time of an eclipse, because eclipses of the sun happen only at times of the new moon. Just think of the geometry. So that can't be the explanation. So even if he did record all of the eclipses, there's no reason that he would have mentioned this event. But third, Gibbon is deceiving you. He's not exactly lying, although maybe we could press that charge. But here's the entire chapter of Pliny. It's 18 words long. Here's what he says. Unusually long, portentous eclipses of the sun also take place, as when Caesar the dictator was slain, and in the war against Antony, the sun remained dim for nearly a year. End of chapter. And he's on to something else. Oh, he devotes a distinct chapter to unusually long darkness. Excuse me? Do you feel like you've been hoodwinked by Edward Gibbon? I think you should. I'm sorry, the least thing I can find to say is that that's hardly a comprehensive record of unusual periods of darkness everywhere in the Roman Empire. Summary. I'm going to go back to the points that I promised you I would cover. There are numerous points of contact where the Gospels and Acts are confirmed by our other sources of historical information. Many of the alleged discrepancies between our external information and the Gospels and Acts are actually not discrepancies at all. And finally, where we find silence in the external record, we have no good reason to expect anything else. From this, I want to draw just one conclusion, and that is if we are to form our judgments based on public evidence, not on some fluffy appeal to faith or the burning in the bosom, but on public evidence, it is reasonable to conclude that the Gospels and Acts are reliable historical documents. Thank you. I will ask Dr. McGrew a question. We'll follow one from the floor and continue. I, I just wanted to note very quickly, we tried for two months unsuccessfully to find an atheist in Dallas-Fort Worth that would debate Dr. McGrew. And uh, no one would accept. Um, so we appreciate those who are here. I did have many questions submitted online by atheists who are not here, but they did in fact have questions they wanted answered. Um, so I will start question one. Why aren't there any primary sources for the Gospels? Why aren't there any external corroborating sources that date to Jesus' lifetime? Okay. We're live here? Good. So 
What exactly are we looking for? If the Gospels are, as I will argue, if anybody wants to go into this, themselves sources by people who were very close up to the facts, I'm wondering exactly what kind of sources would you want to cite? Now, Luke expressly says that he has sources. And so perhaps with respect to Luke, we could ask the question, what were those sources? But as Richard Baucom has argued in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, Luke uses a technique known as inclusio of naming someone, giving a little pericope of information, and then naming that person again. And Baucom documents that this form of inclusio is a known method of indicating what one's sources were. Gospels, I would say, were written for us, but they were not written to us. If we want to understand them, we have to understand them on their own terms. We have to be able to look at the means of citation of sources that they themselves used in accordance with the conventions of their time. So with respect to Luke, I think we do have sources listed. With respect to Mark, a very interesting thing happens if you do forensic statement analysis of the kind that uh, detectives use on statements of witnesses. And that is, you find that Mark is constantly showing up as somebody who's using an eyewitness's record. J. Warner Wallace is a cold case homicide detective who was raised atheist and was an atheist into his 30s. And he finally picked up a copy of the Gospel of Mark just to do forensic statement analysis on it, show that it was all a fabrication late after, uh, long after the facts by somebody who wasn't there for them and be done with it. And what he came up with completely rocked his world because it doesn't read like fabrication. It reads like an account of somebody close up to a source, close, let's say, as Boswell was to Johnson. And at that point, I think we can say pretty well who Mark's source was. And as it turns out, what forensic statement analysis reveals there is also corroborated by the external testimony of the church from Tertullian, from Clement of Alexandria, from Origen, from the Muratorian canon, from uh, all the way back to Papias, we can see that this is consistently said that Mark is writing from the teaching of Peter at Rome. And there are some other pieces of evidence we could bring to bear on that as well. So I, I guess I would say I find that question, what are the primary sources for the Gospels, a little odd the way I would find it odd to say what are the primary sources for Boswell's life of Johnson. Well, Johnson was the primary source for Boswell's life of Johnson. Um, as for the question why there aren't any external corroborating sources that date to Jesus' lifetime, look, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for corroboration of the events of Jesus' life that are of importance to Christians, then I, I would say you wouldn't expect them. Um, let me just read a quotation here. I've got one, I think. Um, should be able to find... Um, this is from the 19th century skeptic, uh, Ernst Renan, and he says, uh, I'm not going to be able to find it, I'll paraphrase it for you, he says, look, it's not surprising that we don't find the Jewish and the Roman sources saying much about Jesus, and the reason that we don't find them saying much about him is that, frankly, he was a obscure member of a despised race on the far edge of the Roman Empire, and Christianity was lost upon the dark background of Judaism. To the Roman eye, Christians were just Jews, but weirder. Sort of like David Koresh is viewed as religious, but weird, right? You all remember 1993? So it's, it's really just not a surprise that they didn't bother to think much about them. We do find some references within a reasonable time we find, for example, in the 60s, uh, there's the great fire and Nero pins the blame on the Christians. Tacitus reports this. You say, well, Tacitus is writing early in the second century. That's true. But he was eight years old at the time that the fire broke out in Rome. And within a decade of that, he was living and studying rhetoric and law in Rome. It's really hard to see how he could not have heard about it from people who had been there at that time. 
Well, Tim, I had the benefit of uh, listening to your presentation on miracles on Friday, so this is going to be a little bit of a recap, perhaps. You must be Sam. Yes, I'm Sam. Great. I don't know how everybody n knew my name from that conference. There was no point where I spoke publicly and said, my name is Sam. Hey, Sam. And, uh, but everybody, everybody, maybe it was that big name tag. I don't know. Might anyway. have something to do with it. I'm a Christian, uh, and I can sympathize with friends of mine who say something to this effect. Sam, <laughs> you might as well not spend a whole lot of time trying to convince me of the historical and the chronological accuracy of the Gospels and Acts. Let's face it. The reason why I have doubts about this material is because it's full of miracle stories. What if you read an account of a yogi who 500 years ago, it was said, could levitate with great regularity, but the account described accurately the countryside in which he lived and specific things that happened during his life. Would you believe that? And I think that's what people struggle with, mm -hmm. the miracle accounts. And I think that some of them strike people as a little bit more out there than others. And you already mentioned uh, earlier in your presentation about the, the earthquake and the mm -hmm. graves opening up and the bodies of the saints coming out into the mm -hmm. city and appearing unto many. And mm -hmm. I think a, a lot of people go, OK, you know, I'd be willing to go along with some of this. But not but the zombie apocalypse. E exactly. <laughs> right. So I'd just like to hear what you have to say. That Their position doesn't strike me as being particularly unreasonable, and I can understand why they have these doubts. And sometimes I struggle to provide a, a compelling answer to them with right. respect to that. Sure. So that's a great question. and. The, the only unfortunate thing is that the answer can get rather long. So I'm going to try not to make a long answer of this. That may mean that in some places it needs to be filled out. But I understand that afterwards we go up to the roof and we can all have more casual conversations. Yes. So we, we can continue the discussion there. Let me start sort of backing out really far and saying uh, I do think that miracle accounts can legitimately be held to a higher standard of evidence than mundane events. So to that extent, I also have sympathy. It wasn't my job tonight to convince you that Jesus had risen from the dead. I was trying to do something else. I'm trying, think of it this way, to narrow the field of explanatory options for why the Gospels say the things they do. Right? Some of the options out there that have been floated are the Gospels are elaborate works of fiction written long after the witnesses were dead. I think we can come as near to ruling that out as we can to ruling out anything in history. That one won't fly. These people are close up to the events. So something else is happening. Either they're right or they're not. If they're not, either they know that they're not right or they don't. If they know they're not right, they are, not to put too fine a point on it, lying. And then we need to explain, in terms of the ordinary human motivations, why on earth they would do that. If they don't know that the things they're saying are false, then they're duped. And we need to account as well as we can in the ordinary human way for how people that close up to the facts could have been duped. So the explanatory options have narrowed if we can nail this down and say these are people close to the facts. But you're right. That doesn't bring us over to the point of saying the miracle itself really occurred or is highly credible. So what can we say about that? Well, I think there are preliminary questions we should ask about any miracle story. One of them is is it worthy of divine intervention? I think it's uh, Horace who has a line uh, to the effect, don't let a god interfere unless there's some knot 
worthy of a God's untying it. Don't just bring God in for anything. And I think this is what goes wrong with a lot of examples like the yogi levitating or to take Thomas Henry Huxley's example, suppose that 12 good Englishmen all told him that they'd seen a centaur trotting down Piccadilly. Would he believe them? And he said, no, not even if I had 12 sober witnesses would I believe them. But you can kind of see why, because there's absolutely no reason that God, if there were a God, would send a centaur trotting down Piccadilly Lane. What would the point of that be? But when it comes to questions of sin and redemption, or even to questions of the existence of God at all and whether he cares about us at all, does anybody think that we have too much light on that subject from philosophy alone? If there were a God and if we were in that kind of need, that would be exactly the kind of message we would need to receive, and we would need to receive it with some kind of seal upon it so that we couldn't dismiss it as the word of a great philosopher, but nothing more, right? We have Aristotle, we have Plato. It would need to be sealed in some other way. One more piece of the puzzle, and all of this is fodder for further discussion, so we can go further on this. I think some people have this curious idea, fostered by David Hume, that a miracle is an epistemic arm wrestling contest between the evidence we have for the laws of nature and the evidence we have for the veracity of human testimony. So I just want to state explicitly it is not the Christian position that despite all of the scientific evidence for them, the scientists are just wrong about the laws of nature. That is not the position. The position is that the scientists are right about the laws of nature, and laws of nature tell us what nature does when it's left to itself. And since that didn't happen here, nature wasn't left to itself. That puts a different twist on it, and it gives a point to Paul's question, why should it be thought incredible to you that God should raise someone from the dead? Not that a dead person should rise by natural means. That's not the comparison class. So I'm just going to put those points out there as a basis for further discussion, and we can, any of us, get into this more deeply uh, up on the roof afterward. Is, Sam, is that a fair start on an answer to your question? That was an excellent Thanks. How do you explain the inconsistencies in the Gospels pertaining to the infancy narratives? Omission is not denial. To omit something is not to say that it did not happen. That's an argument from silence. When we take that out of the equation, what we find is differences indeed, but plausibly there's only one actual inconsistency, and that itself is sort of an implication. Luke says that when they had done everything pertaining to Jesus' circumcision and presentation in the temple. They returned to Nazareth. He doesn't mention the detour heading down to Egypt. He doesn't mention any of that. That's the one place where I think plausibly you could say one of two things. Either Luke doesn't know about it, or for some reason he's choosing not to say anything more about it. I don't have a complete answer to the question why he would decide not to say anything more about it, but I can give you a partial answer. And that partial answer runs like this. If you look at Luke 1 and Luke 2, starting with Luke 1, 5, after the passage where Luke dedicates this to Theophilus and tells him why he's writing it, the writing style changes quite dramatically. It's suddenly full of Aramaisms, of, of Hebraisms, we might say. It looks like a Greek translation of an underlying Aramaic document. And the entire thing is told from a perspective that really looks like Mary's perspective. Mary would have known what Elizabeth had to tell her. Mary knew certain things that only Mary could know in the first instance about that, like Mary treasured up all these things in her heart. Okay? It's very, very focused on Mary's perspective. Mary sees what people are saying in the temple. It's not focused on Joseph's perspective because it tells you what the angel says 
to marry. Matthew doesn't tell you that. I think it is plausible, I won't say more than this, but plausible that Luke has been given a document by Mary or by some member of Mary's family that tells as much as she wanted to tell. If you were Mary and you had had to go through the trauma of watching your firstborn son crucified by the Romans, how much would you want to tell about the fact that there had been a problem with Roman-appointed rulers and members of your family? As late as the end of the first, early second century, a couple of Jesus' grandnephews were actually hauled in before the Romans who said, well, what's your uh, connection to this Jesus guy? And that must have been pretty scary. They're called in because the Romans are afraid somebody's going to lash out in another revolt and people related to this Messiah are prime suspects. So even as late as a couple of generations afterward, these grandsons of Judas, Jesus' brother, were being singled out by the Romans. I think it's at least plausible, again, I won't say more than that, that Mary gave Luke her reminiscences and decided just to leave out that little chapter about the threat to the life of her children. You're free to disagree with me. I don't think that the evidence I provided is convincing all by itself. I think it puts it on the table for discussion, though, and that's about as far as I would go. First, thanks, Tim. Great lecture. Um, I have a question that's very different than Sam's, although I think Sam's question is very important. At one of these BBC events over the summer, we encountered what's becoming increasingly popular amongst the new atheist, which is the claim that, well, maybe this is all fabricated. It's totally fiction. Perhaps Jesus never existed at all. And um, recently I was reading somebody who suggested an argument that took the form of something like this. If you look at the New Testament and the number of allusions that we have back to the Hebrew Bible and the way that the literature all fits together, it's just too good to be true. It looks exactly what you would expect it to look like if something like scripture and divine revelation was possible. But we know that's not possible. So we're just going to conclude that somebody 100 years later made up all this stuff like really, really good fiction. And um, as evidence for this, I want, to, I want to point out this isn't something that's distinctly new to the new atheism. But um, my friend Paul Monado recently brought these two quotes to my attention from Bertrand Russell. And I'm wondering if you can respond to this as sort of a way of responding to the general framework that I'm putting forward. So first, Dr. Russell has this to say. Historically, it is quite doubtful whether Christ ever existed at all. And if he did, we do not know anything about him. So that I am not concerned with the historical question, which is a very difficult one. He says this in Why I Am Not a Christian. But then elsewhere he says this. So little is known of him that Epicurus, a later follower of um, Democritus, was thought to have denied his existence altogether. And some modders have revived this theory. There are, however, a number of allusions to him in Aristotle. And it seems incredible that these, which include textual quotations, would have occurred if he had been merely a myth. He says this in the history of Western philosophy. So the juxtaposition of these two ideas seems to be quite problematic. And is it possible that there's something like a will to believe problem here? That it's just too good to be true, and some of the new claims of the new atheists that Jesus just never existed at all. Um, how does your work on the historical reliability of the New Testament, and particularly of the Gospels and Acts, what would you respond to somebody who just said all that stuff? I think Bertrand Russell is an excellent logician, and he's almost invariably an entertaining writer. But, you know, I'm, I'm just not prepared to accept upon authority the claim that we know virtually nothing about Jesus when we've got sources that I think can, by ordinary historical means, be nailed into that early first century context six ways from zero. As for there being written much later, look, Across the first century, like a deep canyon, runs the Jewish war from 
66 to 70. People who grew to adulthood on the far side of that divide did not have the detailed knowledge of Jerusalem, a Jerusalem so thoroughly destroyed by the Romans that Josephus tells us that aside from one wall that they left standing as a shelter for a garrison there, you could not tell that the place had ever been inhabited. People writing a story, making it up on the far side of that line would not be in a position to give the kind of detailed, accurate story that we have here. And we know what fabricated stories like that would look like because we have the life of Apollonius of Tiana from Philostratus. And Philostratus is writing in the early 200s about a guy who died maybe around the year 100, so contemporary of the Apostle John. He tries very hard to set the life of Apollonius into the context because he's writing for the Empress. He's writing for Julia Donna. He wants to impress his patroness. And he fails miserably over and over. He has Apollonius crossing the Caucasus to reach the Indies. He has him experiencing tides on shores of the Mediterranean where there are no significant tides. He has him visiting with kings in Babylon. Babylon had been an abandoned ruin for six centuries at that point and was only beginning to be rebuilt by the Seleucids in Philostratus' own time. Over and over and over and over he embarrasses himself and he's trying hard and he has resources to try to make it work. People far removed from the events cannot write historical fiction like that. The modern novel was not invented for another 16 centuries after that time and there just aren't the resources. You can read Caliroe, right? There are ancient novels and they're nothing like this. So I just see Russell's statement as, frankly, a rather embarrassing statement for a man of genius to make. And I doubt that he ever paid much attention to the actual evidence in question. That's an answer to part of your question, but I have a feeling I've left something out. Say again the part that I haven't really addressed. Go ahead. So it's not that you haven't responded to my concerns, but um, let, let me say, like, I'm totally persuaded by everything that you're saying. I think that it's preposterous to think otherwise. But I'm just going to try to put on some other people's shoes sure. and, and say yeah. things that I think are preposterous. So suppose that, um, suppose that somebody, say 50 or 100 years after the facts, did their very best uh, with respect to digging into the history as much as they could. And they, they write this account, and they make up some things. And it just so happens that the things that they made up, they just got right about only one wall being left in Jerusalem. And like, th this takes a tremendous amount of faith, far more faith than it takes to just think that these are historically reliable documents, much less that they're even scripture and divine revelation. But maybe an atheist is so unwilling to admit that these are historically reliable documents that they can tell some other fanciful story. I, I, I just, I'm really struggling in how, how, what's the appropriate response to this when reason seems to get thrown out the window way early on? So if you could respond to this, I'll just take the question sitting down. You know, that, that's good. Um, none of this is a deductive argument, right? It's not the ontological argument, Ben. So uh, it's not the kind of thing where we can even hope to attain the sort of certainty that would rule out the very logical possibility of something crazy. That can also be said about all of history. If you're going to uncork that kind of skeptical acid, you can dissolve everything. Richard Waitley, the British logician, uh, wrote a jeu d'esprit at one point on uh, historic doubts uh, relative to Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, saying that really you could make a skeptical case if you used Hume's methodology that Napoleon never existed. He was a fictional character invented by the British government in order to increase national unity. And he makes a hilarious argument of this point after point after point, po pointing out improbabilities in Napoleon's career, pointing out contradictions in sources with respect to what Napoleon is said to have done. Uh, Oliver Price Buell did the same thing with Abraham Lincoln in a book called The Abraham Lincoln Myth. And it's 
it's fantastic. And, it, and he points out real facts, like we have three different texts of the Gettysburg Address in magazines published within a few months of its supposed utterance, and no three of them agree. The fact that Ulysses Grant has meticulous memoirs of the Civil War published in two volumes and never once does he mention the Emancipation Proclamation. How could he miss it if Lincoln was a real character and had really done this great thing? I mean, that, you could even argue it's an event of military importance preventing England from coming into the Civil War on the side of the South. He just doesn't mention it. So if we argue from silence and if we argue from small discrepancies, we can dissolve everything. Now, some skeptics are willing to say, okay, I'm willing to go there. I'm willing to doubt that Lincoln existed if that's the way that the evidence goes. And at that point, really, I'm reminded of the words in Jesus' parable of the rich man and Lazarus. They have Moses and the prophets. If they will not believe them, they would not believe if one were to rise from the dead. We can pursue that more, I know. There are people out here who are not gonna be happy with that answer. That's cool, come talk to me. I want especially to talk to you. So make sure you come up to me as we go up to the roof. If our salvation is dependent upon Jesus' message being clear and precise, why didn't Jesus bother to write anything down? Why should he? I, I don't mean to be you know, too terse with that, but it, that would be a good question if we didn't really know what we need to do to be safe, but it's not all that complicated. I'm not talking about the particular theory of soteriology, your theory of the atonement that you hold to, but look, the, you know, the message throughout the New Testament is very clear. You've got to believe that Jesus rose from the dead and you've got to be willing to confess him as Lord. That's it. Now what it means to confess him as Lord may lead you into some really interesting places, but it's not all that complicated. Um, if there were a deficiency in the evidence, we could complain about that. But if there's not, then I think it's kind of pointless to complain that we don't have the kind of evidence that we could imagine having that would have been better. If what we have is enough, then it's enough. If it's not, you don't even need to re raise the other question. The case is closed. So really, I, I kind of see that as an attempt to deflect attention away from the question, is the evidence we have sufficient? And that's what I'd really like to talk about. Does that make sense? How can anything be a reliable source of history when the authors of a document cannot be verified? Well, I think that we can have reliable information from documents the authors of which we don't know. And we would do that simply by checking in the ordinary historical way to see whether they reveal an intimate knowledge of the time and place and events of which they speak. That being said, I don't concede the point that the authors of the Gospels are unknown in the sense really that we don't know who wrote the Gospels. I know that's commonly said, uh, and sometimes it's buttressed by arguments like this that Bart Ehrman gives uh, in his book, Jesus Interrupted, and also in his book, uh, Forged, he mentions something along these lines. Uh, take Matthew, uh, right, supposedly written by Matthew, but it tells the story of the calling of Matthew. And it tells it all in the third person, Matthew 9, 9, right? Jesus said to Matthew, follow me, and he rose and followed him. Not, and I rose and followed him, or he said to me. It's all in the third person, not in the first person. And Bart wants to bring this to us, right, just as an example of what modern scholarship has discovered, so that we'll be up to the times. How old is that objection? It's 16 centuries old. It was brought up by Faustus the Manichaean in his controversy with Augustine. And Augustine responds, frankly, almost contemptuously. He says, Faustus cannot possibly be so ignorant as not to know that many authors, when speaking of themselves, speak as if of another. It's more probable that he hoped by such means to gain a hold on those more ignorant than himself. And he's right. If you read Xenophon's Anabasis, it's written throughout in the third person. You know, there was a man named Xenophon. He was not himself a soldier, but his friend Proxenus had sent for him, et cetera, et cetera. You read Caesar's Gallic Wars. He's in the third person all the way through. Josephus in the Jewish War. When he's an actor in a scene, it's all third person. Josephus, he, him. 
So this is a very common method of writing. It's common, especially in Greek writings, and there's no particular reason that we should assume that Matthew would have referred to himself in the first person. I have much more to say about Bart Ehrman's method of arguing and his method of presenting these kinds of objections. So if you get me on a really good rant upstairs on the roof, uh, it could take a while, but I'll, ju I'll just stop it with that. Nature of, um, oh, there you go. Um, why Jesus never left a writing of his own, neither did Socrates. So, yeah, you know, it doesn't true. mean he didn't exist. But uh, my question is about uh, the, the reasonable burden of doubt we talked about. Yes. And the question is, um, if you look at, there, is, there was a time when people believed that Troy never existed, that the whole thing was made up, and then we found the archaeological evidence for Troy's existence. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that uh, some of the archaeology may even uh, corroborate with the, some of the details within the Iliad. Sure. So my question uh, is that both in Troy, or if you look at the ancient alien hypothesis about the Mayans and the other Egyptians, being you know, helped by extraterrestrial creatures. Right, or Poseidon rising so, out of the sea and Homer and things like that. Yeah, right. So right, the sure, question is, sure. if we have all this archaeological evidence corroborating this, you know, piece, uh, incredible things happening, mm -hmm. does it follow, therefore, that the extraordinary claims made in either by the ancient alien hypothesis people or in Iliad are therefore true? Because the ultimate uh, question is, it mm -hmm. is those claims that do not meet the burden of reasonable doubt, not the normal historical claims. Right. I understand, and I just want to underscore, and then I'll come back and I'll address your question a little bit more directly, I hope, but I want to underscore again, my purpose tonight was not to argue for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. My purpose was to argue for the historical reliability of the Gospels in the ordinary sense of reliability that we would apply to other historical documents. Now, the comparison with Homer in this case is, I think, uh, not, not helpful because Homer is clearly writing an epic with some fictional setting, right? We, we discovered Troy. We didn't discover the horse, but, you know, it was made of wood. We wouldn't have expected the Trojan horse to be around after this time. But, you know, the, there are pieces of it that gave a historical framework to it, but it does not fall within the genre of biography. It's epic. It's a different genre. And we do have close examples for the genre of the Gospels in Plutarch's Lives, for example, uh, or uh, Cassius Dio. We've, we've, we've got examples of this biographical genre. There's a certain amount of flexibility in it, but all of the Gospels fall well into that genre. That's a first step in driving a bit of a wedge between the Trojan case and the case of the Gospels. Uh, by itself, not sufficient, I think, to overcome the presumption of reasonable doubt that you name. But then, Let's ask some further questions. Supposing that everything reported in the story of the Trojan War really happened just that way, would that answer really to any great purpose? Compare that to the case of Jesus coming, if indeed as the Christians claim he did, and dying and rising again. Would that accomplish any really worthy purpose? Don't let a god intervene unless there's a knot worthy of a god's untying. That, again, I think sets it on a different plane. It doesn't show that God was intervening here or even that there was a god. But it does show that if there were a god and if ever there were a place where he should intervene, this would be the sort of place where we would expect it. That doesn't count as the proof by itself, but it changes the odds in a way that I think shifts them somewhat in favor of this to the point where it makes it a live option, which it really isn't, because you're right, and I think this is what lies behind this. We read the stories in Homer and we say, yeah, that makes great fiction, and it might even make a really disastrous movie if the wrong people got a hold of it, but it's not, you know, just, it doesn't really answer any truly high purpose. And so I, th I think that the, the whole setting of the Christian story gets it on the table. I want to say one thing, it just connecting this to Ben's comment also, Sometimes you hear the skeptical hypothesis, it's not the only one, but it's one of those out there, that the idea of Jesus as the Messiah was generated by the Jewish prophetic writings. The match is so good, right? Um, I don't think that's credible. And here I would suggest a book by Stanley Leeds, 
called The Religion of the Christ. It's a set of lectures, and in the lecture on the Christ of the Gospels, he very forcefully makes the following point. If indeed Jesus lived and did approximately what he is said to have done in the Gospels, then you could see how people, devout Jews, might have searched back through the scriptures and been struck by some resemblances and noted them and drawn connections. But it is not credible that starting with the prophetical writings, someone would invent the story of Jesus to match them. It doesn't. It doesn't make a good match. Over and over, the Messiah is represented as triumphant, and it's absolutely natural to read that triumph in human terms. He's going to crush his enemies. They're going to fall beneath him. The yoke will be thrown off of his people. This is a kingdom restored in a sense that it make, everyone reading it and thinking about it would very naturally have said is a literal fulfillment, and Jesus just doesn't do that, and he doesn't try. So we're forced up against a dilemma here. You can either say that Jesus did approximately what he said to have done in the Gospels, and then you can see why they would have found these connections, or you really have no explanation for why the story is there the way it's there. If you were starting with the prophets and you were making up a Messiah story, it would have looked very different. That's, again, that's just one more piece of the puzzle. I'm just going to put that on the table. Um, I don't think that what I've said to you right here should all by itself be enough to sway you to the point where you say, okay, reasonable, I accept the resurrection. But it's, it's a prolegomenon. This is, to use Darwin's phrase, one long argument. And if you have the patience to look at it, I think eventually you will be persuaded. But I understand that that's a process that takes time and that there are reasonable doubts that can be asked. So I really appreciate your question. Excluding the record of scripture, historically, how do you know Jesus Christ died, was buried, and resurrected? It's a little bit like saying, excluding the writings of Plato and Xenophon, how do you know that there was a Socrates? <laughs> yeah, you know, you, you take away all of the sources, sort of sweep them away, uh, that's a really fast way to skepticism about just about anything. Uh, you could argue from later Christian sources that they believe that. You can argue that from non-Christian sources. You can argue that from Tacitus and Josephus. And yes, contrary to popular dogma, the testimony in Flavianum was not a wholesale invention. It does seem to have been interpolated at a few points, but it did mention Jesus, and so does Josephus in Book 20 mention James, the brother of Jesus. Get over it. But, no, that's not sufficient to support that kind of belief. But that's also a really illegitimate way of pursuing historical inquiry. And if you let me do that, if you let me say, well, you know, except for all the stuff that mentions Lincoln, why do you believe in Lincoln? Dang, I can do a great job. I think what lies behind it, though, is, is tacitly an argument from silence, right? Well, why isn't there more about Jesus? Why don't we see more? And here I'm just going to go back, and I am going to find this now. Here's a skeptic writing. This is As Renan. He says, as to the Greek and Latin writers, it is not surprising that they paid little attention to a movement which they could not comprehend and which was going on within a narrow space foreign to them. Christianity was lost to their vision upon the dark background of Judaism. It was only a family quarrel amongst the subjects of a degraded nation. Why trouble themselves about it? The two or three passages in which Tacitus and Suetonius mention the Christians show that the new sect, even if generally beyond the visual circle of full publicity, was, notwithstanding, a prominent fact, since we are enabled, at intervals, to catch a glimpse of it defining itself with considerable clearness of outline through the mist of public inattention. That is not a Christian apologist writing. That's a skeptical historian who thinks that things like the virgin birth and the resurrection are primitive legends of Christianity. And I think he's right. I think that's exactly the way to view it. It was a minor flap. It was something going on really not on the center stage of the world. It was off there in the colonies, in the far reaches of the colonies. And Jews were weird. They had this Sabbath thing. They didn't let their daughters marry our sons. What is wrong with these people? 
And then you've got some Jews saying other Jews are weird. You're telling me. You're all weird. I, no particular reason for them to follow it. So if what lies behind the question is an argument from silence, then I think Renan's answer is exactly right. If Jesus Christ can be proven as an indisputable figure of history, can we then say that Richard Carrier's job security is a myth? I think we could say that either way. Um, <laughs> Richard has been doing his best to make sure that he will never be employed in a tenured position at an accredited university. And in a way, I almost, perversely, I almost admire the guy for it, right? He's, at least he has the strength of his convictions. He's a crackpot, but he really believes it. And he's working overtime to try to prove to you that Jesus was a rank ragland hero or that, uh, you know, the references to uh, Rufus and Alexander in Mark 15 are really references to Alexander the Great and Musonius Rufus and it's all a metaphor. Oh my God. Um, yeah, wow. Just, I, that's one of those things where I just, I sit back, I make some popcorn and I watch him go. What are the standard criteria for historical reliability of a document? Are the same standards applied to historical documents that do not involve the culpability of all humanity if in fact they're valid? Can I see that one written down, actually? Because I'm not sure I'm quite following what the question is. Just let me, yeah. Um, I'm gonna do my best to, make an answer to what I think might, this question might mean. Um, standard criteria for historical reliability of a document are the kinds of things that we've been trying to do tonight. We try to say, look, uh, can we verify a wide range of things that they're saying? Do cases that look initially like they, they might actually be errors turn out to either be plausibly resolvable or even, as in the case of the path from Tyre through Sidon to uh, the Decapolis turn out actually to be confirmations of the history. Um, when we can do that, when we look at that, and we look at those things, we, I think, get the, the only really good kind of grip we can on most historical documents. We find that the authors are telling us the truth a lot of times. And if they're documents that are written with historical intent, intent and here again, to talk, just to get back to Avaro's question, um, the, the book you want to read on the genre of the Gospels is Richard Burridge's book, What Are the Gospels? A Comparison with Greco-Roman Biography. Second edition is like 2003 or so. And that book does a meticulous comparison uh, with the Gospels and non-Christian writings, uh, bioi, uh, lives. And I think really does a good job in giving us the, the parameters within which we should view the Gospels. There is some variability within the range of biography. Some of it is more literal and historical. Some of it is a little bit more over toward the edge of fiction and can involve fictional elements. Uh, but one of the ways that we decide where it falls in there is by checking a whole bunch of details. And that's why I bored all of you here tonight. I was trying to show you that there are a whole bunch of details we can check. Richard Burridge, B-U-R-R-I-D-G-E. And I would suggest you get the second edition of that book. Dr. McGrew, do you see it as any kind of uh, challenge to uh, the historic uh, reliability of the gospel accounts that when writers uh, uh, cover what appear to be the same events in history, that they do not uh, uh, include the same level of detail in their respective accounts. I would actually see that, if anything, as a step in the direction of confirming the reliability. Um, again, it's really helpful to have a look at some particular examples uh, to, to see, to, to get a feeling for this. So, uh, let's see if I can pull up an example. Uh, Caracalla, Emperor Caracalla, 
dies, I think, uh, around, what, 217, and he's murdered. If you read what uh, Dio Cassius has to say, uh, Caracalla uh, is answering the call of nature. He goes aside, and one of the tribunes, Martialis, approaches him as if wanting to say something, and then stabs him with a dagger. He then flees, but because he still has the dagger in his hand, somebody sees him, and he's killed by one of Caracalla's guards. Caracalla actually wasn't killed by the stab, but some of his other tribunes pretended to go to his aid, and they finished him off themselves. If you read Herodian, uh, Caracalla had just one assistant with him. The other bodyguards went off to a distance to respect his privacy. Martialis ran toward him as if the emperor had called for him. Notice the difference in the accounts, right? Is it Martialis who wants to say something, or is it that he thinks the emperor is saying something? And as Caracalla was uh, uncovering himself, he gets stabbed in the back. Martialis then jumps upon the emperor's horse. Where was the horse in Dio Cassius' account? And he fled, but the bodyguards pursued him and killed him. Very different accounts. And the Augustan history has an even different account, so there's like multiple accounts of this. And yet, what's the headline? Emperor Caracalla murdered by Martialis. Maybe other people involved, but the headline is the same. We encounter this over and over. Try comparing the four sources we have for the death of Julius Caesar, murdered by the conspirators in the forum. What's the name of the first conspirator to approach him? Well, it's Tullius Simber, or Tilius Simber, or Metilius Simber, or maybe Simber Tullius. Um, and does he say anything as he approaches him? Well, yeah, you know, maybe so, maybe not. Uh, where was the first blow struck? Was it in the neck or in the shoulder? Well, different sources say different things. Did anybody seize Caesar's cloak? Some sources don't say. Other sources say it was pulled around his arms to pin them to his sides. Other sources say it was pulled over his head to enable him not to see. Uh, you know, well, uh, what a wild disarray of ancillary facts, and yet the headline remains Caesar murdered in the forum. So we face this in secular history over and over and over and over and over. And frankly, after you go through some of that stuff and you come back to the Gospels and you see some events are told in greater detail by some than others, it just looks like people had better information in some cases than in others. And the discrepancies that there are, even if you just said, yep, I'm going to write those all out as contradictions, would not rise to the level of the contradictions that we find in pieces of history from which we still think we can extract the main story without any question. I think the reason there's this double standard, this skepticism with respect even to the historical aspects of the Gospels, is that there is this supernatural element as well. And that brings us back to the question of the possibility of credibly reported miracles. And that's not a historical objection. That's a philosophical objection. And so we need to discuss that on an entirely different plane. But that's, that's not the task I set myself tonight and the task that you guys asked me to do tonight. And so I'm happy to discuss it. I'm not running from the question. But it wasn't my purpose to try to answer that with the talk I just gave. If these documents are historically reliable, what relevance does that have to claims of their authority and or inspiration? Well, let's start with a negative part, right? If they were unreliable, that would make it really hard to maintain their authority or their inspiration authority in the sense of being you know, a rule of faith and practice which we can follow without fear of being led wrong. Uh, infallibility or inerrancy or inspiration having to do with a high view of the way that God uh, was interacting with the human authors of the text. If they are reliable, I think that puts questions about inspiration at least, you know, possibly on the table for discussion. But I do want to emphasize that those questions don't have to be raised in order to do the historical discussion and that no particular answer to those questions is presupposed by doing the historical discussion. Um, 
I'm really hardcore on the evidence stuff. I want to see where the evidence leads. Let the chips fall where they may. Joseph Butler, in his Analogy of Religion, has a wonderful line. He says, let reason be kept too. And if any part of the scripture history of the redemption of mankind through Jesus Christ can be truly found to be contrary to it, then in the name of God, let the scripture be given up. I'm not going to ask you for an amen, but I agree with Butler. If it's truly contrary to reason, give it up. Amen. Thank you, Sloan. I got, I got one friend here. But, but he goes on and says, but let not such poor creatures as we complain that we cannot see the purpose of an eternal plan and call that reasoning. Just because you don't see all the reasons for everything, it doesn't follow that they aren't there. So, I'm, I, you know, we, we can discuss questions of inspiration, and they're important and interesting, but I think, really, very seriously, those are in-house discussions for Christians after we come to an agreement, not just on the general reliability, but on the core historical facts that lie at the heart of Christianity and the resurrection is the absolute center of that target. Until you believe that, really, what's the point of discussing inspiration? I just, I just, don't, I just don't see it. Some people may try to do a top-down argument. All scripture is given by inspiration. Paul's letters are referred to as scripture and something Peter says, etc. Speaking for myself, I've never been moved by that argument. If you want to talk about an argument for inspiration, start by showing me the reliability of these things. Start by, start by showing me that it's true, and then we can move from there. The documents claim the miraculous as real. Doesn't that disqualify them historically from the outset? Do we want to form our beliefs on the basis of evidence or not? Do we want to follow the evidence wherever it leads or not? If we don't, if it's more important to us to deny that the miraculous has ever occurred, we can do that. And what we'll be left with for explanations are really sort of the best of a bad lot. If we're willing to follow the evidence wherever it leads, it might lead us to places that are unexpected, and that's okay. It's, it's okay to follow the evidence wherever it goes. It really is. Last question. How can we pray for you, your family, and your ongoing work at Western Michigan University? I'm guessing that's not a question submitted by one of the atheists. <laughs> There are a lot of obvious things that I could say, strength, health, uh, but at the bottom is the desire to be used wherever, however God wants. And if you're willing to pray that for me, then the rest can fall where it may. Thank you. Dr. Timothy McGrew.